Previously on the Big Trade series, let's start off by talking about your number one investment that will lead to life success, and how the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. In your newsletter about world dominators, there will always be room for talent, for sure. There, will, it'll always be possible for people who are willing to work harder than other people to succeed. The biggest lesson that my father taught me: nobody owed me anything, and that anything that I wanted to have in the world, I could have as long as I was willing to work hard. And you build a relationship, of course, by giving first. If you look at the one percent of Americans that have the highest income, if you look at the top ten percent of that one percent, there is as much disparity between their incomes. And the ninety percent of the others, you see what I'm saying?、Yeah. So、there are between one percent of the total population and ninety nine percent of the population. Without further ado, we are pleased to present the next installment of this conversation. You are now listening to the Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. In in terms of、uh, okay, so we covered world dominators.、How、Hold on, let me give you, let me give you an example of capital being destroyed. Okay, do you know anything about American football?、Uh, yes. Okay, so the taxpayers around the country have decided to underwrite the building these huge football stadiums. Yep. All right. Yep. So the one the, there was one complex in the 1970s called the Meadowlands that was built, and、mm-hmm. it cost originally something like a hundred million dollars to build it. And supposedly,、um, famous gangster、uh, is buried in one of the columns. I can't remember the name of the gangster now, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So, if you look on the state of New Jersey's books today, you'll still find a hundred and eighty million dollar debt outstanding for the original Meadowlands. So, not only was the thing never paid off, okay, but it was refinanced so that the debt burden grew, and and that and that original stadium complex was torn down five years ago. <laughs> You're telling me the capital wasn't destroyed? Well, someone made that, right? So, so now, went, now, the state of New Jersey owns a hundred and eighty million dollar parking lot, right? Yeah,、But、that was private cap- individual made some of that capital, right? It, it was no. basically no, <laughs> no. I don't believe it. No, I don't. I don't believe that、um, if you if you were、uh, to amortize the cost of that stadium against the profits of the New York Giants, you would suddenly find that、uh, that 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 state debt was just given to the owner of the football team. No, I, I don't believe it. You know what's very interesting, Porter, about the NFL and how the franchise system works is it's completely tax-free. I actually looked into this, and the whole model of, like, you know, having these franchises, these professional sports teams, is they're they're structured in in the form of like athletics, and for some reason, it's all tax-free, all the revenue that they generate. If I don't, know, I don't know anything about that. I know that the players pay a lot of taxes, and I know the owners pay a lot of taxes. But、uh, if there are if there are tax、uh, benefits to it, I'm not surprised because that's the nature of power, right?、Uh, you want to want to socialize all the risks, so you want to get the government to pay for all the stadiums,、mm-hmm. and you want to privatize all the profits. This is really fun. Okay, let's talk about.、Um, I know you did these valuation videos. I know we don't have a lot of time, but let, let's do the valuation video part three. I know. Last time you talked about free cash flow, some components like that, and I don't know. I think I I have a subscription to your site, so I've, I've known that you've done like maybe two versions of that. What would be that new component or new aspect that you'd want to cover if you were to do another valuation video? Oh, that's a good question. That's a very good question.、Uh, you know, I've 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 spent a lot of time trying to teach people that. The way to reduce their risks and make their chances of being successful as investors almost overwhelmingly positive is to focus on the businesses that are the most efficient with capital. And I, you know, it just kind of makes sense, doesn't? I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a bet on a marathon, you want to go with the guy from Kenya because <laughs> he is way more efficient as a runner.、Mm-hmm. You don't bet on the 280 pound American linebacker, right?、Mm-hmm. They they might both finish the race, but there's no doubt that the Kenyan's going to have a much better chance. So I try to teach people how to find companies that are very efficient with capital. And my belief is that, and I think this is I can prove this by looking at long term returns on, on various equities, 
uh, those companies are you know overwhelmingly represented in the top 10, the top 20, the top 30, the top 50, the top 100 performing stocks of the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So I think for most average investors, the thing to do is to buy a company like Hershey, which is one of the examples that I give, mm-hmm. because it's very, very efficient with capital. Put it away, and uh, you know that's it. You're done. Just just buy it, and uh, let the, let the compounding dividends reduce your risk over time, and you'll do very very well. So I, that was the first thing I wanted to teach people because I think it's I think it's the smartest way to invest. I think it's very difficult to beat you know those kind of returns, which are going to be twelve to fourteen percent compounded annually, which is unbelievable if you if you have the discipline to hold for twenty or thirty years. Right. But the second thing that I, I think that you can also do, and I, I don't have a video about this yet, but it would be interesting to see, is um, trying to figure out how to value companies, um, maybe like Twitter. How do you value companies whose operating metrics are very different than, than typical, let's call them legacy corporations? Mm-hmm. You know, a- analyzing McDonald's is a lot different than analyzing Facebook or, or analyzing Google. So uh, maybe like a, a tech a way of a way of looking at uh, capital efficiency and technology uh, would be an interesting lesson. Would that include things like analyzing R and D cycles, anything like that, or any idea, or is this just a thought that you're throwing out there into the ether? No, um, I, you know, I've done, I've certainly done a lot of homework on on this stuff already. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that we're trying to develop for our capital efficiency monitor, which is part of our subscription service, right? And uh, you know, it, it it all comes down to how you define what we call owner earnings. Okay. And, you know, th- th- that's an idea that, of course, I get from Buffett. And it's right. just trying, you know, trying to figure out you know, what's the lifetime value of a, of a Facebook customer? How much does it, how much does it cost to Facebook to get a customer? And those are things that will help you analyze you know, where, where cash flows are going to be in two or three or four or five years. From um, kind of like an intangible component, what I've noticed here in Asia, because I spent a lot of time here, is that things like Facebook, Twitter, they actually act as some kind of like digital citizenship passport to some extent. And the utility that it might have over the course of one's life, I don't know if it will ever be seen in the financials, but a lot of people here use that, I'm sure in the States as well, are starting to use it for commerce, for basically starting their own pages and, and monetizing that completely. How much of that goes into to, you know Facebook's balance sheet, I'm not really sure of, definitely in terms of user count. But um, it, it was one of the thoughts, because I was asked about uh, Facebook when it IPO'd and, and what it meant because you know there's an arbitrage where there's a lot of women here that want to meet people internationally aside from their options domestically and I always felt as if there was a value for that that you could somehow quantify in some shape or form just a thought out there for you sure people try to do it all the time you know what's the value of an eyeball what's the value of an, yeah. I mean, you can look and see what the value is you know you measure cable companies that way you can measure mobile phone companies that way you can measure websites that way i don't put much weight in that kind of analysis yes. not that not that i don't use it not that i don't think about it but i don't put much weight in that and and the big problem with facebook by the way is not the valuation it's not it's not really uh, that expensive of a stock once you understand how capital efficient it is right. the problem with with <laughs> the problem with facebook is management and with share structure yep. and a lot of these companies are designed so that <laughs> of course right the risks are socialized and the and the, and the control is very privatized mm-hmm. so basically you know facebook is is not really even a public company it's it's really this guy um Who's their CFO? Zuckerberger, right? He really hold he really holds complete control over the company, and likewise with Google, you know, they hold all the voting stock. So, what do you really own? Right. And take a look at the acquisitions and the valuations on them. You know, I know you, you're a big proponent of the outsiders. I just spoke to William Thorndike, and he basically just washed his hands of Facebook. Just kind of like we acknowledge that it's like a, a cult of personality, which is Zuckerberg to some extent, but he just, you know, says, hey, I, I don't even bother from, from that perspective. Listen, I, I disagree with him. I think that uh, I think Facebook is one of the greatest global brands that's ever been created. And it is an enormously valuable property, uh, but he is an infant terrible. I mean, he is uh, he is a clown. <laughs> and I think I think I think uh, Facebook's success is a uh, proof of the old Buffett adage that if you want to invest in a great business, make sure it can be run by monkeys because sooner or later it will be. Right, right. 
Hey, Porter, let's, I, I spoke to Jim Rogers recently. You know, he's a big proponent of some iteration of the end of America. He calls it, in his book, Street Smarts, he has um, the sonnet, Osman Diaz, as the, I guess, the first page, actually, of his book, talking about, like, the end of empires and stuff like that. I actually asked him, because I, I thought about this as well as, okay, fine, if America's going to have its, its gradual downfall, I mean, look at, what were the successors of the Romans, which were barbarians, not because they they deserved to do so, but because of the internal shambles that the Roman Empire was in. Um, many people are talking about how China could eventually surpass as the next up-and-coming empire, but I don't know if anyone's noticed, but China's probably not the best kind of country or the one that you'd want to feel the most comfortable with uh, surpassing America in some shape or form. I don't know what your thoughts about that. I know you've been very famous for your End of America video. I know you've changed the view sort of to some extent. Maybe you can give an update on what you think about that and what the gradual successor is. And um, one more antidote I want to share to you is that people talk about how China is going to be the successor, but it's going to take time, Porter. It doesn't happen. I I get that it's becoming free. I, I sit there in Hong Kong talking to some of the largest banks here and they don't believe in the economic miracle that's China, and they're actually looking to participate in EB-5 programs to get a citizenship in the U.S. Because, you know, they think that despite this opening up, it's still very crony capitalism. And I get how America has that, but perhaps it's more acceptable. What are your thoughts? Well, for me, um, the end of America was always an economic uh, prediction. It, it wasn't a political prediction at all. And if you go back and, and you go back and you read my my report, or you look at my seventy seven minute YouTube video, you see very clearly that I'm talking about the role of America's currency as the world reserve standard. And uh, I think that that is completely still, you know, a valid prediction. The um, I must say that uh, I'm very surprised that the euro hasn't collapsed yet. Uh, it's very surprising to me. Mm. I'm very surprised that gold is not much more expensive than it is. Mm. I, really, I really can't fathom why that is. I, I can't fathom why anyone with serious amounts of wealth would rather hold it in dollars that are paying 2% for 10 years uh, than just hold it in gold. I would, I would forego that interest immediately in exchange for the security of knowing uh, that I had a solid asset. And, you know, so I'm not, I haven't changed my opinion about any of that at all. But I have, I have, um, I would say I have a, a deep disagreement with, with, with Jim, uh, who I've known for many years and I, I really adore as a human being. He's, a, he's a, just a great person. And I think it's fine to have a different, have a difference of opinion with your friends. It doesn't mean that, that, that doesn't mean that you don't respect them. I was with Jim in the Dominican Republic, uh, for a weekend. Uh, back in, I think it was in November. It was it was before the big fall in oil prices, <laughs> and, and I was trying to warn him to get out of oil, and uh, he didn't he didn't agree with me. And uh, you know, oil fell fifty percent or something, and and I and I you know I emailed him recently, and I said, "Oh man, I hope it wasn't too bad for you." And and uh, he's like, "Oh, you told me. I just uh, you know I wasn't smart enough to listen." So we 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 have had disagreements before, and um, I, I disagree about this. I think America. Uh, is is by far the most dynamic, uh, most free, and best place to live. I absolutely believe that, or I wouldn't live here. I think we have terrible government, just like just like everywhere else. But I mean, right. government is a global plague. It's not it's not unique to the United States. But what is different about America is, and you know, we'll see if this holds or not. I I believe still that most Americans believe what I believe about personal responsibility. And about not living on, at the expense of their neighbor. Now, look, we've got a political process that caters to the very worst instincts of human nature. So we've got politicians that are actively out there recruiting folks to get on the dole and to be losers and to vote for them and get free stuff. Mm -hmm. And even so, even so, even with all the gross um, corruption of our political system, you know, you still have the Republicans in, in control of Congress. And uh, you still have a president whose approval rating is, you know, in a shitter. Hmm. So, so what I'm saying is, as bad as things are in the United States in a lot of ways, I mean, you want to see the end of America, just go to Detroit. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's terrible, right? I mean, and it's like that in a lot of places in America, B Baltimore being one of them, where I live. It's terrible. It's full of terrible people. But 
it's over that that those problems are overwhelmed by the fact that there are still a hundred million people here that are dynamic and resourceful and repl- and employed and hardworking and uh, capable of creating enormous wealth and and doing things that are incredibly innovative. So if you look around, where are all the world's best companies? They're all the U.S. I mean, we them here, yeah. Why is that? Because we don't have any political problems? Is it because we have low taxes? No. We have the same political problems as everywhere else. We have the same taxes as everywhere else. There's nothing uh, exceptional about America except for Americans. And, and I would much rather, much rather do business with a bunch of Americans than anybody else. We are very uh, resourceful, very entrepreneurial, and we can overcome uh, any kind of hurdle. So I have no doubt that uh, the paper money system will collapse. I have no doubt that the American government will go bankrupt. No doubt whatsoever. Absolutely positively. I can, it's, a, it's just math. <laughs> and if you, don't, if you don't agree with me, then you're not looking at the right numbers. Uh, but, I, but I also have no doubt that no matter how bad things are, no matter how bad things get, that America will persevere and that Americans will be successful. Okay. Let's talk about some of the books that you're reading. I know you're an avid reader. What's on your in your library, or what are you reading currently that's interesting to you? Well, that's a very good question. I'm, I, I try to read at least a book a week. Yep. And, uh, I, you know, you're not gonna, it's, it's hard for you to believe, but I can't even remember the title of this book I've been reading. It's, um, it was a book that was re- written in the 1960s, and it's like uh, 25 uh, business memoirs of the most incredible uh, tales in business. And it's just a history of, of various uh, uh, business deals, both good and bad. And then uh, the book I read today uh, was the biography of uh, the autobiography of, of Boone Pickens. I wanted to brush up on my Pickens history since I'm spending the weekend with him. Uh, it's called, uh, I think it's called The First Billion is the Hardest. So I, those I are. He, he tweeted books. that out recently one time. There was a, a musician that said, The first million is the hardest. And he actually came back to that guy and he actually said, The first billion is actually the hardest. What do you think about Boone, by the way? I know you're going to see him, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, one of your editors had actually kind of like demonstrated how lucky Boone was rather than being an astute investor to to some extent. That's a little ridiculous. I'm not not going to comment on that. I mean, the guy guy, uh, guy is just absolutely a genius, and he is, you know – he is definitely a self promoter, but he's very humble in person, and he he single handedly changed corporate uh, governance in the United States by being uh, what they called a raider in the 1980s. But he was actually not a raider at all. He never took green mail. He always demanded that every shareholder be treated equally, and he then he never let the companies buy him off. He was a he had a man of great integrity, and he he totally transformed uh, corporate governance in the United States. There's even uh, some major uh, uh, court cases that set corporate precedents for the way shareholders should be treated that were, were completely on the basis of his actions. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then in the, uh, in the, in the, <clears throat> when he lost control of Mesa Petroleum, which was his, his, um, his takeover vehicle in the 1990s, uh, unfortunately, uh, his friend Richard Rainwater completely uh, screwed him over. They put in equal amounts of capital into a recapitalization of the company, but Rainwater got four seats on the board, and the first thing he did was vote Boone off the, out of the company, which was re- absurd behavior. And, uh, but, you know, Boone just played by the rules, walked away, didn't sue anybody, didn't complain. Instead, he walked away and he took $10 million and he turned it into $4 billion by doing his own commodities trading. That's not luck. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about a guy who, you know, has made money in so many different ways and has made so much wealth for other people. I think that it's, uh, I think it's ignorant and disrespectful to say that he just got lucky. Okay. Porter, one of the books that I'm reading is actually The Watchman, uh, a graphic novel, actually, written by a gentleman named Alan Moore. And he's quite a, an interesting guy. You might find that interesting. Is I, I know you talked about a ghost story recently, your ghostly encounters as, as well. Alan Moore, he's actually, believe it or not, into something called magic, right? And, and he refers to spells um, very similarly to like how people write, right? Which is spelling, spells, spelling, very similar. And he talks about the manipulation of words and how that's so important to his belief in magic. And obviously you built a whole business about around like copywriting through Stansberry Research and it, it's almost effectively created your whole life that you have now. I don't know what your thoughts are on the power of 
just words overall and how you utilize copywriting and and create a whole business empire, literally, out of, like, I guess one of your bedrooms or something like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't that easy, and I don't think it had anything to do with magic. <laughs> But the um, power of words, maybe. No, no. I mean, I, I can tell you how I was able to build uh, this business. I, it had nothing to do with copywriting. I think that's the myth that a lot of internet marketers try to sell people. Right. It just it has nothing to do with copywriting. It really doesn't. What I did was very simple. I figured out before other people did that the internet was going to radically change the nature of financial publishing. Mm-hmm. It was going to make it was going to make it a much more competitive business. It was going to gr- it was going to greatly increase transparency so that consumers would be able to tell quickly whether or not the publishers were, had any credibility or they had any talent. And most importantly, it was going to greatly reduce the marketing costs. So therefore, as we were able to do marketing at much more efficiently at much lower prices, what I did was I reinvested all those savings into hiring extremely experienced, extremely talented writers who could deliver great results for our subscribers. It's just that simple. And then I instituted very demanding uh, transparency requirements. So everyone had to con- conduct honest track records, and every single thing that we did uh, you know, was recorded and vetted and proven out. And many of the other publishers that were legacy publishers that I was competing against in the 90s are no longer here right. because they never, they never made those adjustments. I mean, I, you're going to think I'm exaggerating, but when I got into the business, there wasn't a single financial publisher that wasn't paid to promote stocks. Every single one of my competitors would take money from stock promoters, and I never would because I could see right away. And I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to say that you know I'm without sin. I mean, you know, I've we've made all kinds of mistakes. Uh, we've made bad hires, but again and again and again, wherever we've made a mistake, we've uh, we've acted very quickly and with integrity to fix things so that our products help our customers. And when I got into the business, believe me, the publishers didn't give a fuck about the customers. They only cared, they only cared about how they could collect revenues. That's all. And I knew that the internet was going to change that. It was going to put those people out of business. And it, and it has. But Porter, what do you think about your use of words? I, I get there's analysts that are very good. And there's arguably probably analysts somewhere out there in the world that are better than the people at Stansbury. But it's how you convey those points to the everyday Joe that creates some component of conversion. I'm not arguing at all that um, you, if you want to be successful as a publisher, you have to have great writing. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that that's the easy part of the business. It's not, it's not hard to learn how to be a great writer. Just go read Stephen King's book on writing, and you're going to have 90% of the secrets. You go read David Ogilvy's book, My Life in Advertising, you're going to have the other 10%. Right. That information is out there. Everyone knows how to write a story. Now, the fact that Wall Street doesn't bother with good writing, that's their problem. It's not, it's not up to me to fix. But I'm talking about my competitors in the financial publishing world. They all know how to write. They all have good copywriters. That's not the reason why we went from zero to the biggest in the industry. The reason why was because we set up the right policies and we made the right investments. I would argue it's just the way they kind of address some of those themes. Like, you know, some of your competitors, if they focus on a bad investment and they promote it, I mean, it just doesn't work, right? So that's where, from a analysis perspective, you might got them beat. But it's also, I I find the packaging, like I've always found as, basically objectively, right? I'm, I'm speaking as a customer, by the way, is that I've always found what you guys put together it's, it's so, like, click worthy. You know, it, it makes me want to see it's just the use of words. It's kind of like, if you don't click on this, you're going to die. Basically, Fine. that's what it feels like sometimes. <laughs> right. But I mean, that's, but, but listen, think about what you're saying, right? I mean, that, that is your experience, but you self selected. So, of course, you say, I like it because you're, you self selected. What I'm telling you is that there is no meaningful statistical difference in the response rates we get from our packages that our competitors get. There is none. We all have the same, we all have, we all use the same style of marketing. And, and frankly, we all use the same copywriters. Now, again, this is a big distinction in my business. I refuse to work with outside copywriters because I wanted to make sure that I was only dealing with people that I had trained that had integrity. So I built my own, my entire own copy group. And I was the first publisher to do that. 
So I spent a lot of money to make sure that I had talented people with integrity and character, and that's what led to our success. But I'm not saying that their copy is necessarily better. I'm saying that they have a, they have a far more genuine desire to serve our customer. And let me give you an example about this because I, I sure. love to use examples, okay? So how many financial publishers at some point in the, in the, in the 2000s put out a big package about – either the twilight in the desert or peak oil or some of that kind of nonsense, which was selling like hotcakes for a decade. The answer is all of them did. Now, how many of them actually believed any of that? And the answer is none. <laughs> you know, my competitors are, are very astute economists and financial folks. They didn't believe any of that for a second, but they knew it would sell, so they published it. And I, what I'm telling you is that when you engage in that kind of behavior in this day and age, what would have never, ever been apparent to the customer becomes apparent today because all those newsletters are still available in the archives and now they see that there's a whole different tune that the publishers are talking about. So there's a lack of consistency because there's a lack of integrity and the audience knows. Interesting. That, that goes right back. We almost went full circle about you know the way you should conduct yourself in business to some extent as well when we're talking about like your children and what they could learn and how they should conduct themselves. So um, two more questions, and we're, we're almost done here. How about let's, let's do this word association game. That way we can address a few things quite quickly, and you can give a quick response to it. So I say a word, you tell me what comes first thing that comes to mind, okay? Sure. Quantitative easing. Money. Gold. Money. End of America. Lots of money. Singapore. Money. The best investment you can make right now. Lots of money. <laughs> that doesn't mix. Okay. Dim sum bonds. Money. Warren Buffett. Money. This conversation. Uh, no money. <laughs> Thanks, Porter. It was great talking to you. Uh, it was my pleasure. It was a good time. I hope that my answers weren't too rambling. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.